Why do we test the null hypothesis? That's the question we're going to answer today and more. Stick around. So why do we test the null hypothesis in an experiment instead of this experimental one? Well, it all comes down to some basic fundamentals of epistemology. Epistemology is just a big fancy word that means how we know things. One of the basic principles of good epistemology is that we want to minimize the number of false beliefs that we have. We want our model of the world that we create, our understanding of the external world, to best match the actual world that we live in. Why? Because that's what's going to best make us able to make predictions and interact with our world successfully. So this is a basic principle, and it sometimes goes by the parsimony principle. And the parsimony principle, sometimes you've heard of this maybe referred to as Occam's razor or something similar to that. But the basic idea is that if you have two possible explanations for the same data, then use the simplest of the two. So let me give you an example. Let's say you know that I love to play basketball and you have been having trouble with your short game lately. And so you ask me, what's your secret? And I say, well, I'll tell you, the real secret is my lucky undies. So I, get, I loan you my lucky undies and I give you some very clear instructions about uh, how to use the power of the lucky undies. I say, here's what you need to do. Definitely don't wash the lucky undies because if you do, it'll wash the luck out of them. So uh, they need to stay exactly as they are. And what you're going to do is that over the next week, uh, you're going to wear those lucky undies and practice every night for two, at least two hours, maybe three hours a night. So you're going to practice every single day because you need those, that lucky undie magic soaking in and really marinating in order for it to be effective. And then next week, we'll uh, see how you perform and we'll see if it made a difference. Let's say, sure enough, you follow my directions, you go through the whole week, and at the end of the week, you find out that actually your performance has improved. And I say, see, I told you the lucky undies would do the trick. Now, as a skeptical person, what do you think is really going on here? Well, there's two possible explanations that we could use to explain your change in performance. In the first explanation, uh, the performance improves because of practice and because of the lucky undies. The second explanation is that performance just improves because of practice. So we have two explanations that both could explain the data. Until we have evidence to the contrary, which should we accept? Which explanation is more parsimonious? Well, obviously, explanation two, that the performance improves because of practice is parsimonious. Here's the thing. We already know from uh, countless other situations and examples that practice seems to make a difference in performance. If we know there's practice, and we see a change in performance, we don't need to have lucky undies as part of that explanation. So if I want to be skeptical and I want to minimize the number of untrue beliefs or false beliefs that I have, then I want to stick with explanation two. Otherwise, I'm going to superstitiously be believing in these lucky undies. And by the way, you don't make many friends while wearing Lucky Undies. So uh, there is an opportunity cost associated with that. So I don't want to invest in Lucky Undies if I don't need to. Let me give you another example. Let me give you another example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. So what if I make a claim about the world? I assert that something is true. And your job is to determine whether or not you believe me. So I have a tree in my yard, and uh, I'm very proud of it. And I take really good care of it. And 
I tell you one day that my tree has an even number of leaves on it. Do you believe me? I'm showing you a picture of the tree and telling you there's an even number of leaves. Do you have reason to believe that that's true? Well, there are only two possibilities. Either there is an even number of leaves or there's an odd number of leaves. It can't be anything other than even or odd. So either I'm right or I'm wrong. If you tell me you don't believe my claim that there are an even number of leaves, what are you saying? Are you saying that there are actually an odd number of leaves? Well, no, of course not. You're not asserting that there are an odd number of leaves. That would be a totally different claim. The correct answer for you to give is that you don't know whether there are an even number of leaves or an odd number of leaves because you don't have enough evidence to accept either claim. The time to believe a claim is when there's sufficient evidence to believe it. So the I don't know uh, should be your default response. In other words, we don't have enough evidence to say that there's an even number of leaves, and therefore, uh, that's going to, I don't know is going to be my default. In other words, that's what we call a null hypothesis. It's where we don't have enough evidence to accept a new claim. Basically, a null hypothesis is just keeping with the status quo. If you don't have a good enough reason to believe anything new, then the null hypothesis is the default answer, where you don't believe things unless you have convincing evidence for it. Now, often in statistics, we symbolize the null hypothesis as H sub zero. And we usually pit that against an alternative hypothesis, which is sometimes H sub one or H sub A, or for alternative. Often in a well-designed experiment, you're going to be pitting the null hypothesis that nothing happens against the alternative hypothesis that something happens. Let's take in a concrete example here. Let's talk about the D.A.R.E. program. I don't know if you remember the D.A.R.E. program from the 90s, 80s, and 90s, but uh, ultimately we spent about $2 billion of taxpayer money on the D.A.R.E. program in an attempt to stop kids from doing drugs. I don't know about you, but before I invest a couple billion dollars in something, I think I would want to know that it works first. So we could do an experiment. We could implement the D.A.R.E. program at multiple schools and then reserve some schools as a control group where we don't implement the D.A.R.E. program. And then we could measure adolescent drug use and experimentation behaviors. So what would our null hypothesis be? We've got a group of schools without the D.A.R.E. program and a group of schools with the D.A.R.E. program. Our null hypothesis in this case would be that the D.A.R.E. program doesn't make any difference in adolescent drug use. The alternative hypothesis would be that the D.A.R.E. program does make a difference in adolescent drug use. So when we approach our experiment, we're, what we're going to be testing is, we're not going to be testing the alternative. Testing the alternative means we're going to assume the alternative is true and see if that fits. No, we're going to do the other. Because of parsimony, we want to use the null hypothesis. That's our status quo, our default. If the null hypothesis is a just as good explanation of the pattern of results that we see as the alternative, then we don't need to bring in the alternative. We can just stay with the status quo. On the other hand, if we collect the data and the data seem unlikely, given the null hypothesis, then maybe we can reject our null hypothesis. If that's the case, then what are we doing? We're not saying we accept the alternative. We're saying we reject the null. And since these were written in such a way that there could only be one correct answer, either the D.A.R.E. program doesn't make any difference or it does, then we are left with the alternative that 
the DARE program does make a difference. Notice we haven't proved the alternative. We have only disproved the null. So the logic of this is, is a little bit unusual, I know, and a lot of people, when they first hear about it, they get kind of uh, confused by this whole idea of testing the null and then rejecting or failing to reject the null and how that's not the same as accepting the alternative. But keep in mind, if there isn't enough evidence to reject the null, then maybe we shouldn't spend $2 billion on the drug, the DARE program. We're not trying to prove either hypothesis. If anything, we're trying to disprove our null hypothesis. We're trying to determine if the null hypothesis, or the parsimonious explanation, is good enough to account for the data. If it is, we fail to reject the null. Why would we reject an explanation that was perfectly good? However, if it's not a good explanation, then we do reject the null. And that only leaves the alternative hypothesis behind as the better explanation. Now, in reality, the DARE program was a total failure, and uh, now they've been defunded, uh, but they're still around, and I often find them begging for donations outside of my favorite restaurant, which is really annoying to me because I don't like being harassed while I'm trying to get a burrito. So, what are the practical uses of this? When you get into null hypothesis significance testing, which is what many of the statistical tests that you're going to encounter uh, are based upon, the, there's a unique logic that happens here, which is you have to set up your experiment such that the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis are mutually exclusive. Either one is true or the other is true. Then you go about collecting evidence and you test whether or not the null hypothesis seems likely given the data that you collect. And if you find that the data is unlikely, usually, that what, what do we mean by unlikely? Usually, at least in psychology, we mean less than 5% of the time you would observe that data by chance. So a, a less than 5% chance of observing that data. Uh, then in that case, you would say, well, this seems like an unusual case given the null hypothesis. Therefore, it doesn't seem like our null hypothesis is good at explaining the data and we should reject it. Rejecting the null means usually that you have a significant difference and that there probably is, there was an effective uh, program or whatever it is you're interested in. On the other hand, failing to reject the null means that you, there might have been a difference there, but you didn't have enough evidence to show it. Okay, I hope this video has helped you understand the idea of the null hypothesis, why we test it, and some basics of the uh, epistemological approach in science. Coming up soon, I'm going to have a video on a related topic, which is type 1 and type 2 errors, and hopefully that will uh, expand your understanding of how parsimony impacts scientific decision making and the scientific process in general. So look for that video very soon. All right, see you next time. I think we really hit the null on the head. If you like that video, there's plenty more where that came from on our channel. Be sure to like and subscribe. You know, everybody always says that, but I never do it. But I tell you what, it really does help. So if you don't mind, just take just a moment to hit that little like button, subscribe, hit the bell icon, do what you can, leave a comment. Those kinds of things really help make sure that we can keep making videos like these and trying to do the best job we can at helping people understand statistics and research 
and psychology.